My name is Aaron Hernandez. I'm the bar manager here at Rosedale Kitchen and Bar. Uh, we're going to be making a signature holiday cocktail uh, for Tito's today. It's called the Tito's uh, Spiced Cider Mule. So we start out, we're going to build our drink uh, in a mixing glass here. We're going to start out with one and a half ounces of uh, Tito's uh, handcrafted vodka. We've got a spiced apple cider here as well. And this is gonna go in at three ounces. So if you wanna you know, batch a whole bunch of these or have it served punch style for a party, you just know that you know, it's two to one. There's, there's twice as much cider as there is Tito's in each cocktail. So you can you know, build appropriately from there. I'm gonna get my mixing glass all filled up there and have my uh, serving glass filled as well so that this has some time to get nice and cold um, while we stir over here. And you don't have to stir the drink like this. You can build it straight into the, into the copper mule cup. But with something as viscous as an apple cider, um, you'll get yourself a more blended cocktail if you give it some stirring beforehand. But you don't want to shake it because that'll give you too much dilution and you'll lose some of that nice apple cinnamon uh, flavor behind it. So just go all the way in there. And then I have a ginger brew here on the side, ready to just top that off. And traditionally a Moscow meal would have some lime juice in there and we would garnish it with a, a wedge of lime or maybe perhaps a lime wheel or a dehydrated lime, something other if you're feeling real fancy, but we're gonna stick with a cinnamon stick here. And I like to give a, a nice stir whenever I use a cinnamon stick, um, just so you know, some more balance, more blending, so our ingredients start to marry together. And then hopefully our stick is long enough to garnish in such a way where we can present it visually. So there's our Tito's Spice Cider Mule. Cheers. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Lauren Petrowski, and I am honored to be your MC for this fantastic evening as we come together to support March of Dimes and learn from some of the best chefs in Austin. The way that we're coming together may look a little different, but the dedication to fighting for all moms and babies is as strong as ever. We are here for a very important mission, but of course there is some fun to be had tonight, and I think you're gonna like what we have in store for you. But first of all, in order to make an impact for all families, we need your participation throughout the program tonight. So make sure you chat with us in our share your thoughts section. We wanna hear from you. Don't be shy, keep the discussion going all night long. On behalf of our platinum sponsors, JL Gray Construction and Service Lloyds, we thank you for joining us tonight. The impact of this evening would not be possible without the support of all of our fantastic sponsors. With your support, March of Dimes will continue to empower every family to get the right care when they need it most. A healthy birth for every child is a goal worth fighting for, and you can make that a reality tonight. This evening, you can donate simply by clicking the Join the Auction and Give Today link on our homepage. Trust me, you're gonna wanna check out all of the terrific items that we have on our silent auction list. I know I can't wait to get to bidding. The auction closes tonight, so start bidding now. Signature Chefs has always been a premier event for you, our guests, but our participating chefs provide all the entertainment and get in on the fun as well. Even with the impact of COVID-19 that it has had on the restaurant industry, our chefs stepped up and they wanted to do something to support March of Dimes. Those chefs have put together a one-of-a-kind culinary experience for you tonight. I know that I can't be the only one who is running out of ideas and new things to cook at home, and who better to help spice things up than some of our favorite local chefs. And in true Austin form, our chefs decided that a collaboration, not a competition, was the key to tonight's success. Before we get started with the show, I want to introduce our participating chefs. Hey 
got incredible ingredients here. We kind of got to finalize what we're doing. But before we get to that, just reminding everybody, um, this meal matters um, for what we're about to about to do for the March of Dimes. And we've been able to uh, share the evening um, with a great friend and our host, uh, Lauren Petrovsky. So she's going to be our guest chef and host and help us get this meal prepared. Hey, chef. <laughs> hey, Do you Lauren. think I was going to let you have all the fun with the food? But that was, I don't think so. Right. So I guess you guys have kind of gotten started on what you're going to be making. Yep. I'm excited to see it all come together. But we've been talking a lot about these special ingredients. So let's go around and share those ingredients. Chef Ansel? Yeah, absolutely. So I brought uh, a mustard oil. Uh, so it's a oil made from mustard seed. Uh, it's traditionally used in Indian cuisine a lot, but uh, you can also use it in just any kind of vinaigrette. Basically anything you would use mustard in, this is a way of getting that same flavor without having the texture of like a whole grain mustard. I've never used mustard oil before. It's, I'm not even sure if I've heard of it. Yeah, it's, <laughs> not, it's not super widely known, but it is, I think, super delicious. It, just a couple drops of this can change the whole, the whole dish. You know, you don't have to use a lot of it, and you uh, don't have to be a whiz with like flavor matching. Mustard's in so many things, so yeah. instead of a, a mustard sauce, drip a couple of this, drops of this on right before you eat, and you're going to have a really uh, impactful flavor. Love mustard. I'm a mustard over ketchup girl, awesome. so I'm excited for this. <laughs> <laughs> Chef Wolf. Do you guys have mustard oil in your kitchen right now? No. Me neither. Oh, but I'm going so, to after this. Good, it's yeah. a good choice. Oh, good choice. <laughs> uh, Chef Wolf. I brought uh, Calabrese peppers, um, which, um, spoiler alert, Janelle has the same bucket over there. Yes. So. <laughs> Great minds. Not Great like minds. we haven't worked together before or something. <laughs> These are brined uh, chili peppers um, and a lot of salt and a lot of vinegar. So um, I think as chefs, we know that the a couple flavors that are incredibly important is acid and salt. So this helps bring all that together. But the pop of spice is really fast. Get a quick sweat, um, but these will these will translate to all, also almost anything. And as you well. use those a lot. I do. Yep. Chef Ronald's also well seasoned with the Calabrese peppers. Yes. 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 Um, I I love them because they're so versatile. Um, we actually use these here at the restaurant. Um, I, I blend them with garlic and grapeseed oil to make this really wonderful chili pepper sauce that goes with our ribeye. Nice. Yeah. It's good. Raw garlic. Uh -huh. Nice. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay, Chef Weiser. No mustard. Peppers. Mustard oil. No peppers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is called, we call this furikake. And it's a bit of a stretch to still call it that, but it's inspired by a Japanese uh, rice seasoning called furikake. It's traditionally made with uh, nori. This is made with uh, dehydrated kale, crispy shallots, crispy garlic, um, maldon, sea salt, lapo chili powder, citric acid, and black sesame seeds. And watering. It's a garnish, <laughs> it's a garnish that's I'm in love with. Say the name again. Furikake. For furikake, how yeah. long have you been using furikake in your cooking? Oh, a couple years maybe. Yeah. And and the I feel like the recipe gets modified. The recipe evolves. Mm -hmm. But yeah. hold on, he, he's making it himself, which is also not <laughs> common. Okay. Yeah. All right. Have you yeah. have you two made no. homemade? For, no. No. Have you? And so, uh, yeah. no. so you think it's <laughs> so, no big deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it can be purchased on uh, contigotexas.com. Oh, wow. yeah, yeah. I, I should have brought some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all, all Times are tough right now. We gotta <laughs> plug any time we can. Sales are winning. <laughs> all right, chef. That's I'm great. so excited to taste what you're gonna make with these special ingredients. So I think it's time to get to work. All right, this is gonna be fun. I cannot wait to see how our chefs use those secret ingredients. Thank you to everyone who has donated so far and to everyone who's participating in our silent auction. We are well on our way to meeting our goal of $250,000 for March of Dimes Austin. If you're not registered, you can get on there right now before we get to our fund the fight levels this evening. Just click join the auction and give today. Since March, 360,000 babies have been born in Texas. A lot in our lives has been canceled or postponed due to COVID-19. But one thing that can't be rescheduled is a baby delivery. I would know because I gave birth four months ago. And I can also tell you from experience that the care and support that pregnant women and new moms have been receiving has definitely changed over the last few months. 
March of Dimes has been able to provide much needed services to families during the COVID-19 pandemic, including offering many support programs virtually. Thanks to support from our COVID-19 relief fund and our volunteers, we were able to program tablets with March of Dimes content, video chat platforms, and offer setup support. Hospital staff were able to offer March of Dimes education and support to patients in maternity units and in the NICU. Mothers who unfortunately tested positive for COVID-19 at the time of delivery were able to connect virtually with the nurses caring for their babies. We are proud to announce that that program has been such a success that March of Dimes will now be able to expand the project outside of Austin. So tonight, of course, is about the food and the fun. But we know that you wouldn't be with us this evening if you didn't believe in the work of March of Dimes. Our sponsors, volunteers, and chefs have all worked tirelessly to put together a fantastic event. And throughout this evening, I will be announcing opportunities for you to get involved. Fund the Fight is your opportunity to make a difference tonight. Each of you can join in at the level that is most meaningful to you. No gift is too small, and all of your support will fund the mission of March of Dimes. To kick off our giving this evening, I am thrilled to announce that Cindy and Trey Schultz, our 2019 Ambassador family, have continued to support March of Dimes in honor of their sons, Tristan and Sawyer. They are making a lead gift of $10,000 to get us started tonight. I know that this is a big ask, but I can think of no greater cause worth fighting for than the health of moms and babies. So who is going to join them to support March of Dimes? Thank you so much to Trey and Cindy. Let's keep the giving going. I wanna tell you about an important part of this year's Signature Chefs. To help thank the many healthcare professionals who have worked around the clock to ensure safe maternal and infant care, part of this year's event includes Meals That Matter. Sponsors were given the opportunity to gift meals to our healthcare heroes from our partner chefs. To thank these healthcare heroes who have worked so hard to keep moms and babies safe, we are proud to have delivered more than 200 meals to healthcare professionals in maternity and NICU units across Austin. When we reach our goal tonight, we will be able to deliver another 200 meals. So if you have not already, please get registered and click the thermometer below. At this time, we wanna thank our donors who have committed to giving at the $5,000 level. So a special thank you to Tom and Aaron Moravle, Beth Mandel, Chelsea and Jason Gray, can you join them? Please make your gift now and help us reach our goal. And don't forget to check out the amazing auction items and bid for babies. Did you see that RV rental? Who doesn't want to get away right now safely out on the open road for the weekend? Sounds pretty good. Thank you to everyone who has given so far this evening. Please keep it going. Now let's get back to the cooking. <laughs> All right, chef, prep time. Yes. Talk about what it takes to prep your kitchen at home if you're getting ready to make a big meal. Well, I think um, it's the same. You'll hear this phrase mise en place from chefs everywhere. That means everything in its place. The more you do before you start cooking, and certainly before you're trying to like cook the final dish to, to serve people, the better off you're gonna be. So get yourself set up. Think about all your ingredients, your tools, your workspace, and kind of get it set up so that you can work clean, you know, have if you're prepping a vegetable, you want to do it before your guests arrive, have a Tupperware ready to go, chop it, put it in there, put it away so that you can get all that stuff out of the way, clean up after you work, and then when your guests show up, you're not stressed out and freaking out. Yeah. When he says Tupperware, what we really need are prep cups that all stack, that are all beautiful. They're not 25 pieces of different kinds of Tupperware that don't stack, that you can't find a lid for one size container with one lid. And so what we're doing right now is gathering those types of parts and pieces before we ever start cutting. The chef Janelle is getting some water on the blanche. Chef, what's going on over here? Um, so these are baby steps that we're getting started. Uh, we've got a big pot of water going for blanching green vegetables. Um, blanching is one of our secrets to keeping green vegetables green. I always season my water pretty heavily with salt. You want it to taste like the sea. When you're chopping big, thick things, you don't. You want your knife to be able to still be standing up. Otherwise, you get in the middle of it, you're yeah. pushing on it. Oh, no, I've been there. Breaking or whatever. 
So uh, when I saw that butternut squash, I knew I had the tool for the jump. <laughs> and you can already just tell that this is just a beautiful, very happy piece of meat. I'm going to separate the spinalis muscle, or what's known as the ribeye cap. When you, when you get a steak, right, you always get this nice, beautiful, fatty piece on the very top. Then there's the loin, and there's another little side muscle. I'm going to remove, to me, the best part of the steak. Okay. Now we're going to have a different preparation for that. And literally no knives, the first thing that you do is find the separation. Just going in. Just going in, right? Most of the time in fabrication, your job is just to find and separate the muscles that are already natural in that process. Towels obviously you don't want a bunch of blood all over the place. So you can call this a ribeye loin. Uh -huh. This is the ribeye calf, this is the ribeye loin, and you've got two two most side muscles. Number one, it's gonna be a lot more consistent. So when we break this down, this is the only tricky cut to me, just because you've got to just measure the end of that loin and kind of the beginning over here. In other words, if I'm gonna if we're eating together and you get this kind of a steak yeah. and I get that, one of us is we're gonna fight. It's gonna One's be bad. One's happier than the other. <laughs> yeah. So uh, now we've got it down to the loin, and I'll trim the fat, the silver skin. This, if you ever see the silver skin on here, uh huh. It's the same striations as that. This is okay. something that you do not, you really don't want to eat. You don't want it. Okay. No, because it's just not that out of so we'll Trim all this down, and then actually for during the process, I mean we're four people, maybe five or six. They're gonna meet tonight. Way, way too much. So, <laughs> right? Leftovers. Yeah, definitely leftovers. <laughs> but we'll also cut this in a way that we're gonna. You know, roast it whole, and then we'll slice it, and then plate. Ben brought up a good point earlier that what we do in the kitchen would kill most home kitchens as far as the smoke and the butter and the fire code and all that stuff. So we are uh, we're going to show you guys how to actually broil in your oven. Okay, we appreciate that. How we can do it at home. It's almost like a reverse sear kind of a situation. And you can tell that I mean that that fat in there, that striation is just it's very pretty very pretty. We know that it's going to be a good piece of meat. And if you buy a good piece of meat, you don't. I mean, we're going to put probably salt and pepper on this only when we get down to it. Okay, so you got the knife, um, yep. and then it's scooping the seeds out. Yep. We're gonna, and this is just, we're just going to cube this up and roast it. Uh, but we're also going to take some more of it and make like a mash or a puree with it. So, and then the other part of it, this guy I'm going to come back to in a little bit. Uh, we're going to use a mandolin, but you can also do it with a sharp knife to make ribbons with it. And we're going to put that raw in our salad so that you get a little crunch. Uh, Perfect for this time of year, I think. And then you're showing us three different ways that we could use it. I, will say, I said raw. We might do a quick blanch on it. We're going to taste it. If it's a little too earthy, you know, that's kind of squash has a very unique flavor. We'll throw it in some boiling, lightly salted water for like 30 seconds, pull it out. Uh, run it under cold water or throw it in ice so that it still has a crunch, but we can cook some of that. get layered flavor into dishes as quickly as possible so that we can get it out the window and prepare for the next course. We make a sauce called Salsa Verde. What are you using for this one? So for this one, I'm gonna use parsley, uh, mint, some of these chives. I'll typically use something like capers, but I'm gonna chop up some of these sea beans. It's full, yeah. it's full of like salt water, it's really crunchy. The sauce is going to be herb based with olive oil and a, a neutral, maybe canola oil. Raw shallots that are diced. Yeah, so we'll see. That's good. And then that will go, that will dress the asparagus dish. Okay. Um, so this is the sauce that's gonna go on the chilled asparagus dish. Okay, great. I think this dish is such a great example of how you can really use vegetables and herbs and make it have so much flavor, which I know you do really well. People may be familiar with Contigo's menu, having a lot of really interesting meat dishes, um, but you're so good with vegetables too. is the pot of um, beef fat trim from the ribeye and so what we're doing is we're letting that slowly cook down and that's going to turn into like this beautiful golden 
liquid beef fat that you can use to saute with. You can brush it over your steaks before you grill. You can rest your steaks in liquefied beef fat. It's just adding flavor on top of flavor. Nothing goes to waste here. And that's what I love is we're teaching people at home how they can really use the whole cut of meat. Absolutely. I've also got another pot of water going here because um, I've got some vermicelli noodles. Uh, the rice noodles are really traditional in Asian cooking and we're gonna turn that into a steak salad. So um, the, the rice noodles are one of the easiest things to cook. You boil water and pour it over the noodles and just let it sit until they're tender. It's just, it's keep it simple. <laughs> You want to have nice even sized pieces if you're roasting them together so they all cook at the same time. So what I did is trim it down and I'm using all these odd scraps. We're going to make a mash out of it. So we're going to puree that we're going to cook that puree. It won't, won't matter what size it is. But then I have nice even pieces of roasting so that they cook evenly all the way. Such a good tip. to give them. Yeah, so we cut cut it in half because we're only feeding about six people or so. This is still going to be very, very generous. We're going to talk. Normally, in a restaurant, we would be searing on this flat top, we would be searing even on this French top, or get a really, really hot pan. Salt, pepper, super hard sear, but the smoke, you can see this in a hood, we don't have that in the house, right? So too often, even if you're cooking a small piece of steak or a piece of chicken, you can't get it hot enough because everybody's afraid to set the fire alarm off or whatever. Okay, so I've done that a couple yeah. times. So what we're gonna do is a reverse sear almost. I've got the broiler, which everybody has in their oven. Usually okay. nobody ever uses it. Um, so we're gonna season the steak just like we normally would. Basically, we're yes. pretty generous with that. Very generous. Um, we're basically making a ribeye roast. And the reason why we're going really liberal is because when you eat this, <clears throat> We're gonna, I know that we're gonna slice it. Well, the only thing that's gonna have salt and pepper is really just on the outside of that. So when you cut it and cut it and cut it, you might have one side. So you really have to offset the seasoning for how much you're actually going to consume on one bite, not the whole size and shape, but what do you physically consume? That's how you season accordingly. So if it's a piece of trout and it's very thin, Sometimes you only season that one side because you're gonna eat top and bottom. In this case, when you cut it and cut it and cut it, you might only get that little nugget, which means you you have that much salt and pepper and surface area to compensate for all other six sides. Yes, very good point. So that's why it's important to have it very well seasoned on the outside. Broiler, literally, I'm gonna put that in there for about eight to 12 minutes. I don't, first time I've used this particular at uh, Rosedale Kitchen, so we'll, we'll keep an eye on it, but we're gonna try to get a really hard crispy sear on the outside using the broiler okay and then 10 minutes before we're ready to serve it we'll re-sear it quickly a little bit of smoke just to get a better sear on it and then we'll plate it so it's kind of reversing that process a little bit. yeah sounds good so of course we're here for the food and fun um we're having a great time but also it's for a great cause we're raising money for march of dimes it's so important to everyone here and i know it's extremely important to you and your family so tell us a little bit about that so my son Brandon uh, was born prematurely and spent the first few months of his life in, in the NICU. And back then we didn't realize or understand or had even heard of what March of Dimes is or was. Only several years later did I realize the impact that they had on our, on our child's life. Um, and so I've been giving back for a long time to do whatever we can to help make sure that other mothers and other babies have the same opportunities. So. Brandon's okay. He's... She's now 24 or five, I forget. But. What? So obviously March of Dimes then has been important to you guys for years. And I know that they appreciate your support year after year. Um, you know, why do you keep wanting to come out and cook and be a part of this event? Uh, well, number one, it gets, uh, gets the word out to continue to raise awareness and funds for the March of Dimes, but also gives us an opportunity to cook together as friends and, and do some incredible events together. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a win-win for everybody, but it's it's a, it's an annual event that we look forward to every year, and I get to hang out with some incredible people, cook some delicious food, and help, help moms and babies, so. We appreciate you.
All right, I love seeing our chefs hard at work in the kitchen, knowing that all of that work is for a great cause. We are here tonight to support moms and babies. The U.S. faces an urgent maternal and infant crisis that has only been intensified by the COVID-19 pandemic. Every 12 hours, a woman dies due to complications resulting from pregnancy. Additionally, two babies die each day. Those numbers are disproportionately higher for moms and babies of color. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce a very special family who knows firsthand the importance of March of Dimes. The Mosleys are here tonight to share their story with us. We found out that we were pregnant with Adrian. We were um, excited. We had a gender, a surprise gender reveal too. So one of the Christmas cakes was actually gender the gender reveal cake. Right. <laughs> reveal cake. So, you know, we were having a boy. And so I, I went to the doctor, just a regular checkup, just to say, you know, I think something's going on. And the doctor was even insisting that everything was fine and um, normal. And I insisted that uh, he should check the cervix. I came home that night uh, and I, I went on um, bed rest. Um, actually under the direction of my mother-in-law to, you know, put my feet up and basically don't go move, do anything. They took her um, after the surgery and I followed the baby to the NICU. You can see his, his little chest just flutter. And, um, you know, it, it, it was a lot to take in. In the NICU in the beginning, this, this ring that's very snug fit on my finger is, is, was loose fitting across his leg. I was in a lot of pain still, um, and I couldn't walk. The doctors told me I would still be in a lot of pain because I had a C-section and I would be sore, so. Pain was still to be expected. So we went home that evening. Um, I still wasn't feeling well at all. I just felt I was very dismissed on triage. I began to decline even more, um, just paying attention to, to my body. I was watching my belly um, grow. It was kind of getting bigger than when I um, came into the hospital pregnant and I was still in a lot of pain too. So they ended up admitting me um, back to, to the hospital that day. I had been calling a nurse like constantly since our shift started. And uh, when I found those um, blisters uh, later on that night, um, she came, she looked, she didn't know what it was. She left out, she went to the charge nurse, charge nurse came back. She wasn't sure, they both left back out and they, they came back with the doctor. He looked, um, he looked down there and um, he had a very peculiar look on his face. I was told that uh, some of our organs were having a tough time and that um, we had to wait it out. Nurses had to remind me to sleep. I wanted to be in both places. And if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm by my son, then I want to spend more time with my wife. Our primary physician at that time acknowledged that these conditions are perfect for infection. I felt like if they were listening um, to me, they would have been caught much earlier. I kept saying that over and over, like you guys told us there was a high probability that this could happen. It was a life or death situation at the point when the doctor saw the blisters. Knowing that it was preventable um, was like the hardest thing to, to kind of grasp. It's like, this could have been prevented. I remember the, the first time coming to the NICU was like, like I was the new kid on the block because I was missing uh, for so long. So it was like, oh, your mom. It's like, yeah, mom, you know. So I was in the hospital for uh, 34 days. Um, Adrian was 144 days. It was a long journey. Uh, Adrian was really, really tiny. This is amazing, um, the care 
that nurses give to such tiny babies. The March of Dimes has, has given us um, a space to grieve or to heal. It gives families hope. It gives me the encouragement that I need to know that there's an organization out there working towards creating a better experience for moms and babies. You know, I escaped death and that it could have been me. This is, you know, why I, I share. Thank you for supporting March of Dimes because without your support, my family wouldn't be here. Thank you, Keely and Adrian, for sharing your powerful story with us tonight. Your journey is why we are here this evening. March of Dimes fights for a world in which every baby and every family has the best possible start. Before we get to our next Fun the Fight level, I have an amazing announcement. March of Dimes was born out of a national health pandemic, so they've been here before. Founded more than 80 years ago by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, March of Dimes rallied the community to support our most vulnerable. March of Dimes established the Roosevelt Society to continue that legacy. Austin is fortunate to have two members of this society fighting for moms and babies, Andrew and Leslie Morgan and Carly and Clayton Christopher. They have graciously decided that they will match tonight's Fund the Fight gifts at any level up to $50,000 of giving. That's right, we have the chance to raise $100,000 for moms and babies just like that. So who will answer their call? Who will help support us tonight at $2,500? This is your chance to have your gift matched and turn $2,500 into $5,000. Thank you so much to Randa Stevenson, Barbara Clemenhagen, and Eric Kelly for your pre-committed gifts at $2,500. Please keep the giving going and join them tonight. All gifts and option purchases tonight will help fund the mission of March of Dimes. So please keep giving and keep bidding. We will now begin the giving at our next level, $1,000. You can help tonight and honor the Mosley's amazing story and get your gift doubled. So please keep the giving going. We are so excited for the rest of the evening as you keep bidding. Let's get back to our chefs. Gonna start to have a little fun here um i know that you guys have worked in lots of different kitchens i'm gonna ask you to search your chef brains and think about uh a couple embarrassing moments where maybe you have royally messed up a dish um or maybe it was when you were starting out so as soon as you can think of one it's on my externship at the peabody in Orlando, Florida, and uh, made a huge, 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 huge operation in the banquet kitchen. The task was to concasse. Um, concasse, everybody. Uh, blanch and peel the skin off tomatoes, right? And then dice them eventually to perfect squares, skinless and seedless uh, tomatoes. But it was 40 cases of tomatoes, and it was my first week. The chef says, do you know how to concasse tomatoes? I said, sure. I culinary school I'm like, I can say no problem so I got a big huge tilt skillet that has like I don't know 120 gallons or whatever boil the water dump almost all of the tomatoes that I can and they basically turn to mush because I didn't control the temperature no he says what are you doing I said I don't know I screwed up and we, and they I don't really know how to concasse be out of the banquet kitchen for the first part of the, and they rotated it to the end because they didn't think I was qualified to do the thing so I was a new cook at this restaurant out in Napa, and I was given the task of making a, a glaze that's used on a, a burdock root dish. And the way that I heard it was, I need to do this recipe times eight, but I guess what he was telling me was that he had already multiplied it times eight. So while he wanted, I, I don't remember what the yield was at times eight, it was two cups maybe. We ended up with a container, about a year's worth of this stuff. Nice. Yeah, and, and, and not, yeah not, and Napa, I imagine, cheap ingredients, uh-huh. Cheap ingredients, and they were out, now they're out of all the ingredients that I just used to make a year's worth of this glaze, so. That. So what was the reaction when that happened? 
Uh, kind of the, the sad dad <laughs> approach of just the the eye the eye roll, the the head shake. Uh, and I didn't stick around too long. I went back to my cutting board and put my head down and, and uh, tried to just keep working. Tried to redeem myself. Learn from that one, I'm sure. But what I had happen that was embarrassing was when we were just starting out making sausage at the farmer's market, we got invited by Uchi to cater their staff party along with this upstart food trunk truck called Franklin Barbecue. Oh, we it's a little old food, food truck. Back then, we were both new, new kids on the block. It was a huge honor to have a restaurant like Uchi ask us to cater something for their staff. And it was out at Lost Pines. They had, they had rented a thing. It was a, I mean, it was a great party. It was you know, my first interaction with them, other, other, as, other than a customer, I knew a few of the, I knew the folks who worked there, but I didn't know them very well. And I was really impressed at how they treated their staff and all that made me really inspired. And I asked one of my good friends, very talented chef, to help me cater this because I was like, this is, I'm in a little over my head. And he made this great salad, with just absolutely delicious. And he brought this thing he had made at home to top it. And it was crunchy candied quinoa. And I was like, oh, wow, this is great. He's like, yeah, it's really going to set this salad off. And so we're serving it. And Phil Spear, at the time the pastry chef of Uchi, now of Commodore, comes up and eats it. And he goes, what's this on top of this salad? Is it, can- is it candied quinoa? And I said, absolutely. And I explained the process and I bragged about it. And he just kind of chuckled. He said, I like that. And then later, uh, I got the Uchi cookbook. And I found the recipe for candied quinoa that my friend who had helped me had used. And I'm pretty sure it was Phil's recipe that he had, he had put in the cookbook. So that's why the chef liked it. I mean, it was a good use. My friend is a very talented chef. He put it together deliciously. But here I am bragging about it as if it was this great culinary innovation that we came up to the guy who wrote the recipe. (laughs) As soon as they're ready, I'm going to strain them out, throw them in here, and run some water over to stop the cooking immediately. So that's the tip to blanching. Quick, and then bowl of ice. I'm just going to do that maybe with his asparagus. It's a great way to prep vegetables. You keep their color, you keep their freshness and flavor, but you get that just slightly unpleasant rawness that some vegetables have off. If you have a cast iron like this, it's fantastic to use because it just holds, it holds the heat way more than any other the hands go. This is the beef fast. fast. We took all rendered down. We took all those scraps, anything that can't be really used for anything else, all rendered down. Then we strain off the impurities, and then you get literally liquid aged beef fat. So just another another oil source, another fat source. And since we're doing steak night and we're doing roasted mushrooms, instead of using canola or olive oil or whatever, you use the same ingredient that you kind of rendered it from. Delicious. It's not going to have as high as a smoke point as some of your oils, but you want it to get it smoking. First thing that we're going to do is add the mushrooms, and we shook it once, so we're not going to touch it. Okay, Mushrooms have a tremendous amount of moisture in them. Too often the pan's not hot enough, and all of a sudden the moisture all comes out, and then you got these soggy, braised mushrooms. Treat mushrooms like a steak. You really want an outside sear, so you're creating a textural contrast on the palate, a crispy exterior, and a very soft moist inside so that's kind of what the plan is and so you can see all the mushrooms that we have i'm only if if you get past the surface area of your pan you're adding too much so all of these mushrooms are going to be able to hit the bottom of this we can add a little bit more fat also they're like sponges so they're going to absorb the oil and so you kind of got to compensate for a little bit as we go another shake If we added the onions and garlic too soon, they'll burn before the mushrooms are seared. So we want to make sure that we add. And I also cut them knowing I didn't fine chop these because I want them to have time to cook before they burn, right? Got a little bit of that. Then we're going to do this in batches. Smelling good in here already. Have some thyme. Rosemary sprig. Chopped parsley. Crushed garlic, same kind of a thing, so we don't have to burn it. Salt and pepper. And now is the first time that we're really going to be flipping or changing this. But if you can see, that's yeah, what you want, right? getting a nice sear on those. So it's going to be treated just like, just like a steak. 
So this is the searing part. We'll do this in two or three different batches, put it on a sheet sheet tray, and then we'll finish them in the oven when we're ready. When we're ready to go, we also have some whole butter. And we're almost making a pan sauce within the deal. Notice we have shaked it a couple times. It's getting hot in here. <laughs> So this is, this is an 80% preparation. I know that in a matter of minutes or 30 minutes or an hour or whenever you're going to serve this, I'm cooking this to 80%. So by the time I reflash it, I, I haven't cooked it all the way, so I'm giving it 20% more time in the oven. So the timing is going to be right. But this can sit even for a day if you wanted to, and you're only going to reheat it when it's ready to go on the next round. Great tip. Go back in your mind and think about an embarrassing moment, a big lesson you've learned, a mistake you've made that you're willing to share with everyone. <laughs> Valuable lesson that I've learned is when you are draining the fryer and cleaning the fryer, make sure that the fryer valve is closed when you refill it with oil. That was an embarrassing and messy day. I've learned a lot from this guy. Yes, um, I, not everybody knows it, but I, tried out for a cooking show that Chef Bull was trying to get off the ground back in what, 2005, four? Like 2004, 2005, and it was called Heat, and um, I cooked in the kitchen with him at the Driscoll, and then he offered me a job. I learned a lot from him. Oh, so you should go way back. Yeah, go way back. Yeah, yes. We are so excited to be here with you this evening. Our family thanks the March of Dimes for allowing us to be here to share our journey. We look forward to seeing how the rest of the night ends, and I can't thank you enough for the generosity and support. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Keely and Adrian, for joining us tonight. I know that together we can reach our goal and honor your story. As you've seen, things are heating up in the kitchen and on the bidding boards. So thank you to everyone for donating and for participating in our auction and fund the fight so far. If you have not given yet, don't worry, there is still time. We're now going to kick off the giving at the $500 level. So who can support the fight for healthy moms and strong babies for $500. Please give now. We've had such amazing support so far. Thank you. But of course, we're not done yet. The reality is that motherhood is hard from preterm to postpartum, infants to toddlers to preteens. March of Dimes is utilizing its platform to bring together our community leaders and equip moms to becoming their own best advocates in dealing with some of today's biggest challenges in her home, at the workplace, and during doctor's visits. Because we know it starts with mom. March of Dimes' newest initiative will host bold, authentic, and diverse conversations about the issues that matter most to moms and moms-to-be, but often go unspoken. This November, we're bringing together expert panelists and diverse voices aimed to make change happen. March of Dimes can only offer those unique and critically needed programs because of donors like you. Your gift this evening will ensure that March of Dimes keeps going. So who can donate at $250 to support moms and babies in our communities? Thank you again to everyone for all the amazing support tonight. Keep it coming. We need everyone to get involved. We are so incredibly thankful for your support tonight. Your gift is making a difference, so thank you. Our chefs have more secrets in store for you in this segment, so while you watch, don't forget to keep up with the auction. Bidding will end at the end of the program. Let's get back to the kitchen. Yeah, let's talk a little tartare. This looks delicious. Tartare. So we used uh, one of the side muscles from the ribeye. We're just going to have a little chef snack before we sit down. So it's got the diced raw beef. This has shallot, uh, diced cucumber. Um, Drew's going to help me. Thank you. Uh, a little lemon zest. So we've already got salt, pepper, mustard oil. We've got some of the rendered beef fat. 
Again, the trick to me in tartare is number one, the quality of meat, but then number two is the size and shape of the beef. And you can see everything is smaller than the beef. You don't have big chunks of onion, you don't have big chunks of cucumber. In this case, everything is gonna be smaller than the beef, so the actual process and the chew is nice. And we're using those lettuce, those little lettuce wraps. Chef snack, yes. sounds delish. On top of that, we've got avocados. that we're going to put on top. And then this is bloomed mustard seeds, chopped anchovies, olive oil, mustard oil, shallot. And oh my gosh. That, on top of that. that looks absolutely delicious. Yeah. And then we're going to wrap these up. It's like a little lunch wrap. A little chef snack while we're, while we're cooking. I would say I'm not very good with the knives. Um, one to 10, I'm going to give myself a four, a five. Um, I do like, I enjoy prep work, but I'm sure that I could improve on the knife skills, chef. So, um, you know, we saw you chopping the beef and the veggies, the herbs for the tartare. Obviously it takes some skill there. Teach us your ways. Um, so the selection of the knife is also really important as far as what style is concerned from a, from a French knife, uh, to a utility knife, to a bony knife. There's a, there's literally a knife for every, every tool. I like this as a utility knife. It just works really, really well. But honestly, the whole trick is your comfort level with your fingers, right? Is a huge situation because you'll never gain the knife skills that you need if you can't cut with complete confidence of your hand, okay? The hold, usually this cliff here is where I like to grab also with my thumb and my forefinger and rest it very comfortably here. It's never like this because you have no control when you're pushing down. So it's really how getting really comfortable with a nice, nice firm grip. And then also just to be able to manipulate this, okay? But what we're gonna do talk about the confidence of basically being able to have this knife against my finger that's curled in order to have any knife skills whatsoever. Now you can do this all day long, that's fine, okay? But in order to have knife skills, this has to come against the flat part. Not like this. This is where people cut off the tips of their fingers all the time. We don't want that. Keep the front of the knife on the board, bring the knife to the front of your finger, your knife and your hand and your fingers are actually cutting it like this. The knife never goes off my finger. And I know that it's not gonna slide because I have I have my knife against my finger the entire time. So my finger's guiding the knife. It's not my knife being separate from my finger. They act as they act as one. Um you could you could chop it that way. But if you're looking at my finger, it's just a guide impressive there's no there's no way i'm going to cut myself because i'm not letting separation if this is separated i've got a chance of the of the knife coming back on onto the finger i would get cucumbers i would get something that sits flat don't try to get a butternut squash for example that's really difficult and and so it's yeah you've got you got nice secure on your cutting board and you just you just got to practice one finger out front flat against it and can you go from there? Clarified brown butter that Janelle provided for us. Pretty classic flavor to go with squash, just super fall flavory, um, super delicious. So I'm gonna stream that in here. These are the scraps of all that butternut squash. I just poached them in water, but I did uh, dry roast them in the pan to get some of that browning color. So we'll see what that does. It may be, will be good, it maybe will be weird. Uh, get a spoon, I'm gonna taste it, and then I'm gonna add cream, salt, and pepper to finish, and hopefully it doesn't need anything else. If it does, we'll get back to the drawing board. How's the salad coming along? 
good. It's really light and refreshing, tasty, healthy. It's delicious. So much color, too. Yeah. This may win the Beauty Award. <laughs> Can I ask if you have any tricks to plating um, when it comes to how you're going to make things look pretty at home? Sure. Um, one like really easy basic technique that you want to think about is like a, when you're plating in a salad, um, you want to grab with really loose open hands and then you can kind of almost pre-mound it in your hands so that when you come to plate it, you're kind of mounding it up because you want that height. Um, another good trick is to um, have some negative space on your plate. So if you're gonna plate off center, so that there's a little bit of negativity on one side of the plate or the other. Um, okay to leave open space. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You don't feel like you have to crowd the plate. Um, um, I cook pretty simply, um, I, it, like on my menu descriptions. When you see what it describes on the menu, you're gonna get your plate of food and you're gonna be able to identify those ingredients. Um, when you're saucing, Use a spoon and sauce as close to the meat as you can so that you have more control over how much it's going to pool around the meat. And always let your meat rest before you slice it so that you don't slice the meat and put it onto the plate and then you immediately get bloody juices that run all over. Very good tip there. Chefs, it's been, you know, a few long months. I know it's been hard for everyone. It's got to be really nice to come together and to cook together. Yeah, absolutely. This is, uh, it's one of the fun things about these events is getting to hang out with our friends and get out of the restaurants for a little bit. Is that why you wanted to participate tonight? Uh, that's part of the reason. It's a really great cause. The team that heads up the event for March of Dimes is also a pleasure to work with. Uh, so yeah, we get to, a, a, lot of, a lot of positives for us. Yeah. Chef, you are hosting us tonight in your restaurant. I know all the chefs are grateful for that. Why, why did you decide that you wanted to be such a big part of tonight's event? Um, I think this is my sixth year with March of Dimes, and uh, Chef Bull is actually the one that got me involved. And it's just been something that I've loved to do every year to see everyone come together for such a great cause. Um, we enjoy spending the time together, and it's helping babies. <laughs> Helping moms and babies. Who can argue with that? Uh, wh why are you here cooking with us tonight? Well, for a lot of the same reasons everybody said, first of all, the cause is just like incredible. Um, there's nothing really more important, I don't think, than trying to give everybody, every baby, every person, every family uh, a good, healthy start to life so that, you know, they can get through whatever challenges they have and have an opportunity to succeed. And I, I really appreciate the mission. I mean, it's gotten bigger and better every year. Obviously, COVID's changed things, but this is a really cool and new way of doing it. It's smaller, it's but it's like getting to spend this amount of time together is really great on a personal level for me and I think for all of us. And to still be able to, to be able to do that and still support such a great cause is really exciting. Chef, well, we know that um, you have a personal connection to March of Dimes uh, and your family's been involved for years. Yes. Um, you know, you come back every year. It's It's got to be nice cooking with, with your fellow chefs tonight. It is. Yeah. I mean, we, we weren't sure how we were going to manage the uh, the fundraising mission this year, but I can, uh, I think, speak for the team that this is this is fantastic. We're looking forward uh, to doing more events like this. So there are some silver linings during this time period and one is to continue to have the opportunity to support moms and babies. So um, this is just thrilling for us to be together and you know, this is the least we can do. This is our part. We get to have fun and doing something that we enjoy, but um, now it's time for everybody to support the mission. So we've done our part and now it's time to do yours, right? Donate now, get it done.
As we near the end of our evening, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight to support March of Dimes. The generosity that we have seen is incredible and we would not have been able to be so successful without the amazing leadership of our event chair, Chelsea Gray. So please join me in welcoming Chelsea to say a few words. Thank you, Lauren. While I wish we were all together tonight, I'm coming to you from the Bitterroot Mile Club in the beautiful state of Montana. I know that there's a lot of charities to choose from and your support means so much to us. I'm so impressed with what the March of Dimes has put together virtually. What a great lineup of chefs and how fun to see them collaborating for the health of moms and babies. I'd like to start off by thanking our sponsors. This would not be possible without you. A special thanks to our platinum sponsors, JL Gray Construction and Service Lloyds. Their commitment to the March of Dimes mission is truly appreciated. I'd also like to thank our other sponsors who helped make this evening a success. And the rest of our sponsors. Thank you so much. I'd also like to thank my committee for helping me ensure tonight's success. As a mother and a physician, the March of Dimes mission is extremely important to me. The March of Dimes fights for the health of all mothers and babies, no matter who they are, where they come from, or what they can afford. They advocate for policies to protect them and improve the health care that they receive. They empower these families with knowledge, programs, and tools so they can go on to have healthy pregnancies and their children can go on to live healthy lives. But this is not easy and this cannot be done alone. So I'm encouraging every single one of you to donate to fund the mission. No amount is too small. Your gift matters. Your support will make a difference. The spirit of Austin is truly amazing. I am so honored to be serving as chair of this event. Now, who's going to outbid me on the Montana package at the Bitterroot River? The auction is ending soon. Thank you. March of Dimes is only able to do the amazing work that we have talked about tonight and more thanks to the tireless commitment of our volunteers like Chelsea. She's right, no gift is too small and I challenge all of you to give however you can. We can all help make a difference. Thank you to the Signature Chefs Committee for dedicating their time and talent to this event. Tell those amazing individuals how much you're enjoying this evening and thank them in the chat. A second group of volunteers are instrumental in our success, the Austin Board of Directors. This group has provided the advice and leadership to help March of Dimes move forward in these uncertain times. Their guidance made it possible for us to still celebrate as a community this evening. Thank you to everyone for your generosity. It is simply incredible. Your gifts are critical to the ongoing success of March of Dimes to fight for each and every family. We cannot thank you enough for coming together in this virtual way when moms and babies need it most. It's beautiful. I heard, I heard <laughs> some whistling from the crowd. Yeah, she's pretty. Yeah, she's pretty. <laughs> and now this, you can just tell that this this portion is just going to be a little bit more manageable, right? It's like right. these big, big hunks of yeah. slice. It wouldn't, to me, it wouldn't present incredibly well. Andrew likes it, I can tell. I can hear him whisper <laughs> over there. <laughs> so this would be good just by itself, but, you know, it's March of Dimes, so we got to raise a lot of money for babies, so we have a few other ingredients on there, okay? All right, I'll put okay. some small ones on there. So there's your ingredient. There's my there's my favorite ingredient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Looks fantastic, chef. Ribeye, mushroom, and calabrese. It's a beef bag. One of the things that we did with the uh, ribeye that Chef Will butchered was we trimmed off all the fat mm -hmm. so that we could render that down. And you can cook with that liquid beef fat. You can saute with it. Mm -hmm. You can coat your steaks in it before you put it on the grill. You can use it in sauces, you can make a vinaigrette. And I chose to make a beef fat pumpkin bread. Oh my gosh. And, <laughs> and so this pumpkin bread is drizzled with local honey and a little bit more of the rendered beef fat. 
And we're gonna serve this with some vanilla ice cream. Wow. Beef fat pumpkin bread with vanilla ice cream. Yes, ma'am. My can <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Nice job, everybody. Nice job. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Save. Just pass it around. I think we should do this a lot more often. Yeah. I think this is like a pre-Thanksgiving kind of situation. Yeah. <clears throat> oh my gosh. I'm... Nice job. Love cooking with you all today. Yeah. I'm yeah. not even going to taste it. I know how delicious it's going to be. You're ready that you screw up. It's like the best beer I've ever had. <laughs> great texture, great texture. Well, I just um, we got there in the end. <laughs> I want to thank you all for, for being here today, um, for being in Rosedale and, and cooking together and sharing your time. Um, I know that we are all super grateful to you for getting us involved in this, and um, it's been six years, I think, yeah. for me. Yeah. Um, and right. something I look forward to every year. And, we weren't sure how this was going to work this year, and I think we, we, we put something together really nice to Absolutely. I think we help know. mamas and help babies. Thanks for letting me be a part of this. Yeah, absolutely. Welcoming yeah. me into the kitchen, letting me <laughs> taste your delicious food. It's so good to see all of you chefs and to support such an amazing cause like Mark Dines. Wonderful. You did great. Absolutely. You did great as our guest chef. You're hired. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys, for joining us. We'll see you soon. Well, that was fun and delicious. I hope that all of you at home picked up a new skill or two that you will be able to use in the kitchen. On behalf of all of our volunteers, sponsors, the Mosley family, our chair, Chelsea Gray, and the March of Dimes, we thank you for your generosity. Tonight, you rallied to support March of Dimes and the hard work to improve the health of all moms and babies. Your commitment to our shared vision of strengthening families by providing the support that they need is something that we can all be proud of. I'm Lauren Petrowski, and I am so grateful for the chance to be here with you tonight. Being four months postpartum myself, I'm so glad to be a part of an incredible event that supports moms and babies. Thank you so much, and have a good night.